Okay, in this video we can see a more elaborate version of the biplane. Before producing the web struts on the previous biplane, I cloned off a copy so that uh, I could pursue this alternative track. You'll notice a number of things that are quite a bit different about this model than the previous one. First of all, it's got a smooth aerodynamic quality. We'll have to look at how to accomplish this. Second, there's a coloration. So we see different color on various features of the fuselage and wings and we see some more elaborate modeling on this as well. So we see a, an engine, a cowling, a nose cone, and some struts. You'll also notice if I take a quick pan around the geometry that I have an open cockpit, we have an air scoop on the bottom, and you notice the other features as previously mentioned. So how is this uh, plane that was made out of facets how is this made so aerodynamic and smooth? If I go ahead and select the plane geometry, um, we'll go down into the polygon level of the um, topological features here. You see an orange bounding box around that. That's the actual faceted model. And at this level, I can turn on what's called the NERMS modifier, NERMS, uh, short for non-uniform rational M-spline. So if we look under the subdivision surface area, we find the use NERMS subdivision. And if that's turned off, you'll notice, yes, all we have is a faceted model. This is a really powerful feature. So if you can roughly approximate the geometry, all the smoothing and curvature can be produced automatically uh, by using the NERMS subdivision. So with this turned on, we also increase or decrease the amount of iteration and if we get up to you know three or four we see this is smoothed off quite nicely don't go above three or four or you'll end up crashing the software now if you choose to modify the model while it's in NERMS mode you'll need to gain access to the polygons that comprise the plane so to do that you actually pick on the bounding box you don't pick down on the smooth mesh the smooth mesh that you see in here in a sense is a sleight of hand we don't actually have the smoothed out mesh until we collapse this uh, and tessellate the surfaces. And that's only necessary if you're going to move on to have something printed, 3D printed or fabricated. So as long as it remains in the virtual realm, there's no need to carry the extra burden of polygons. So should we choose to modify the surface, I'm still in the polygon level. Um, and let's say I want to do something to this plane here in the upper portion of the wing. I'll actually grab in the plane on side uh, the bounding box. Um, and so you'll see this is the, what's actually picked. The bounding box um, on top here, the plane here, is what corresponds to what we see down here on the surface. So potentially we could select that polygon and then we could continue to modify it by using extrude, outline, inset, bevel, bridge, flip, and so forth. We could also introduce extra subdivisions here by using the split and slicing planes and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and select hinge from edge and we could simply just click hinge from edge and then go out and click an edge or if we want to set this up for example to adjust the angle or the segmentation then we want the dialog and of course if you're working in 2011 or 2010 um, all of these features would be sitting right at the cursor uh, in a much more elegant interface. So I'm going to pick my hinging edge. Here is this leading edge of the polygon and we see now we have this kind of bubble or bump and we could make adjustments to the amount of hinge or we could add extra subdivisions which is going to make this a little bit more sharp and of course that's a crazy looking wing. We don't really want that but the point here is just to show you how this could be done while you're simultaneously in the NERMS mode. So other things that were done to the fuselage, like the scoop down here at the bottom and the cowling, um, all of this was generated just simply by beveling, extruding, and shaping the original fuselage and wing shapes until uh, this form was made. The cone is actually a supplementary geometry that was added into the uh, plane. Um, and then the wings, it was done the same way. Now in terms of the struts that um, link the top and bottom wings, let's let go of the fuselage. These are actually supplementary pieces. And if we look carefully at this, we'll see that this is accomplished by using the lattice modifier. 
The lattice modifier simply takes the tessellation pattern and objectifies it. So the planes in between are gone. Let's turn this off so we can see. This is just a simple plane broken up into these four triangular pieces. So we have our truss-like shape. And if we add the lattice pattern on top of that, um, it takes all of those lines and makes them three-dimensional. So um, if we look carefully, we see there's two elements of this. There's a joint and there's a strut. And if you look inside the lattice modifier, uh, you can find in here struts, and you can give those a dimension, a segmentation, so you could make them smoother, rounder, or more faceted. Um, and they can also have end caps and so forth, and necessary if we're going to go print. And the joints are a supplementary piece. Now both the struts and the joints have a material ID. Make note of the material IDs in both of these. So the strut has an ID of one, the material has an ID of two. It doesn't really matter what the number is. You can invent the number that goes in there as long as it correlates to some material that you develop. So along these lines, you see the rest of the plane also has coloration. So we have a dark gray, we have a glass lens here around the canopy, we have a yellow, we have a red, and we have the light gray. So all of this was set up by using a multi-sub-object material type. If I come up to the Material Editor button here at the top of the screen, um, I'll get my Material Editor dialog. And inside here you can see the multi-sub-object material type that I've set up. I set this up with five channels. There are five IDs in here, and these correspond to various polygons inside both the struts and the rest of the plane. So I have an ID of one through five. Once again, it doesn't matter what the number is. All that matters is that you use a number that corresponds to some number out here where you place this. So for example, ID number four is the ID that I place in the polygon here at the back side of, of the wing. Um, ID number two is the ID that was placed in the polygons that make up the tail fin. Okay, so how do we set up a multi-sub-object material type? You can just choose an empty channel, and once you've done that, you come to the material selection button here at the right-hand side of the interface. And if I click on this, I'm going to get a long list. Let's not worry about the details of all this right now. We'll come to material um, placement and configuration later. I'm going to find the multi-sub-object material type. It's going to ask me, do I want to dispose of the old material? It doesn't really matter one way or another. We'll worry about that in the future, uh, more detailed discussion. So by default, this is going to open up 10 channels. Each of these is roughly equivalent to any of the others up above. So it's a way of splitting one of these cells up into multiple materials. Um, it is quite possible to take advantage of this as a way to deepen the material palette. I'm going to change the number to just be five. You could make this number greater or you could make it lesser. It really should just be set at your convenience and as is appropriate. Each one of these um, also can give a, be given a name. It doesn't really matter. The name doesn't affect anything. That's just for your reference. Uh, so it's a good idea to name things. So to set up any one material, just click on the button here on the right hand side. Um, all we're going to do for right now is change the color. So if I click on the color swatch, for example, I'll give this a yellow. I'm not going to change anything else. We'll go back to parent. We see now that we have a yellow color that resides in this slot. Um, number three, for example, that's the, um, the rest of these would just simply be changing the color. Number three, I can actually make that a piece of glass just to show you. So I'll click on this um, button and we will change the color. I like my glass to be a little bit greenish. And so we've got a slightly glass-like color and then we want to change opacity. Okay, I wanna point something out here. This is actually a standard material and it's fine to use it for something as simple as this. But should you find that as you set up an multi-sub object and you want it to be mental ray, begin by setting that to arc and design mental ray and then we would change the color inside the color swatch here. Uh, so the way the nomenclature um, is assigned and its meanings and values are not quite the same as in standard and, and uh, scanline materials. So to avoid confusion, it might be best to have everything set up to be mental ray um, arc and design. The only other thing we would do for the glass is to change the transparency. So this is the one thing that's a bit different is in 
Menta ray, it's based on the amount of transparency, and in standard, it's based on the amount of opacity. Uh, essentially the same thing, but only in reverse. Other thing you might like to do if you have glass is to turn on this checkerboard pattern. It just allows you to identify that something is transparent or not. Okay, so we're buried inside a material type. We need to return to parent. At the parent level, we see we have five material options in here. So you would proceed by you know assigning color to these other slots, and then you simply drag the material onto the geometry and automatically is gonna go to the correct address. So how do we get the addresses on the polygons? If I select my plane and I'm in the polygon level, I'll click on some polygon on the plane and you'll notice in this area called polygon material IDs, we have a set ID and we have a select ID. For example, if we want to select all the number fives, it's gonna pick all the number fives. Now that they're picked, we could do something to all the polygons that have address number five on them. If they don't have an address on them to begin with, you could pick either by selecting one at a time and holding down the control key or windowing, uh, whatever it takes to make up your selection set. And then once a polygon is selected, you can simply type in the set ID box some number. In this case, I'm gonna type in number one and then hit enter. And if we click out on the screen to release, we see that now uh, a polygon of address number one resides in the top and it gets the dark gray color.